I'm not supposed to like you. But? But I want to do that again. Welcome to Your Pick, a film podcast. I'm Tatum. And I'm Geneva. We are two friends who love movies and love sharing them with each other. Each week, we take turns picking a film that is close to our hearts and talk about why it moves us, to tears, to laughter, and everything in between. We celebrate the craft of filmmaking, as well as the unique and personal ways we find meaning in the movies we watch. Dun, da, da, da. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what, what to say. I feel like there needs to be some, like... <laughs> big introduction or something um i know that you the listener assuming you are there uh it seems like we've been recording episodes every week but we have not <laughs> been doing that uh I, it's been like almost two months since yeah, we recorded it's been an episode. a long time we're a little like wait how do we do this again <laughs> yeah a, a little bit uh discombobulated i think uh because geneva's been an angel she's been editing all of the episodes since i've been uh unable to really do anything other than work and figure out my life um but we are happy to be back recording this week um it might be a little bit rough I don't two months is a long time to not do this I'm kind of like I don't really remember how this goes (laughs) (laughs) um but we're gonna try our best at least we're starting with a movie that's like or restarting I guess with a movie that's not super like analysis heavy because if it <laughs> right. was it's pretty you know, straightforward yeah if it was like Amadeus th- this this would be th- th- this would be <laughs> rough I think um not that Amadeus is not fairly straightforward and certain of its themes but yeah I, I, I just I know feel what you're like saying. I feel like that's a movie where you have to really like I don't know there's just a lot more of jumping into like intense themes and mm. what does yeah, this I mean what does this represent mm-hmm. um and it's also long so <laughs> it's <is> true <laughs> this um is not. yeah but speaking of long I'm pretty sure well I know for a fact Geneva has a very long list of things that she's mm-hmm. been watching because again it's been like almost two months so Geneva why don't you give us just the highlights of a few sure. of the things worth mentioning I guess absolutely <laughs> Uh, oh, goodness. Uh, all right. I'm just going to go through my list and Ooh, just okay. pull out super quickly a couple of first time watches Okay. That uh, since the last time we recorded. So first, Predator, <laughs> the Arnold Schwarzenegger 80s That was your first time seeing action it? Action movie. First time seeing it. Okay. It's great. It, it ruled. Yep. <laughs> we love it. Arnold. <laughs> it's a classic for a reason. Mm-hmm. Um, Second, a movie called The Sweet, uh, Sweet Smell of Success from 1957, which is a pitch black um, satire of the news industry and politics and ambition. It stars um, Tur- Tony Curtis as kind of this kind of scummy, creeping uh, press agent who's desperately trying to make it. And Burt Lancaster playing sort of the embodiment of evil which he's mm. great at, and I really, really like this movie. Um, mm. If you like a really dark um, satire, it's a f- film that I think it may have started off as a stage play, and you can kind of tell it's very like limited to only a few locations and a pretty short time frame, um, but it's really gripping. And I thought about it a lot afterwards, so yes, highly recommend. Um, I think I watched The Zone of Interest after we recorded, which of course is excellent, as everyone... I think you did, yeah. We talked yeah. about it a little bit on one of our Oscar episodes, I think, but mm-hmm. yeah, I don't think we had I think I had a... not seen it by that point, yeah. Yeah. Um, or no, I had seen it by the Oscars, but um, mm-hmm. yeah. But I wanted to mention that because after seeing that, I then went and watched Downfall, which is a, mm-hmm. um, I think originally a tv movie from oh i a didn't German know that tv movie i could be wrong about this but a uh, highly highly acclaimed um film about the last few weeks of hitler and his officers and his secretaries um and then a few other people within the nazi regime um during yeah the the last few weeks before hitler killed himself and then the germans surrendered 
in World War II. Um, it is an excellent film. It is, again, gripping. It's long, but I could not look away. And I would highly recommend it if you're interested in that period, if you're interested in um, kind of the psychology of power and evil and how um, they operate. It's a really great film, not just for the memes, although the memes are also great. <laughs> I don't think I know any memes for that movie. Yeah, there's a famous meme that, I mean, like, even my mom knew about this meme when I was telling really? her about this movie. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> it's Hitler in the bunker yelling at his generals, and people put other, like, words over what he's saying to make oh. him say, like, complain about ra very random things. Go look it up. It's pretty funny. Yeah, I'm looking it up right now. I think I've it's an older this. meme. It's been around for a while. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, next, a movie that I have definitely not stopped thinking about since I watched <laughs> it. A drama called Ordinary People, which I watched because it won Best Picture back in 1980. Uh, it stars Mary Tyler Moore, Donald Sutherland, and then Timothy Hutton as a sort of breakout performance. This is a very quiet um, drama about a family who recently suffered a loss, and now the son is... Um, struggling with his mental health basically the entire family is dealing with their grief in different ways and it's just an excellent beautiful very sad but very compelling film all of the performances are absolutely wonderful I mean this is you know I'm, I'm sure there are things that we've since learned about mental health um, you know a after this movie this movie is what 45 years old at this point but I think especially for the time, but even for now, it's a really um, effective portrait of struggles with depression and suicide and um, grief and trying to find purpose in life and trying to connect with people that you love, but you find it difficult to communicate with. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's a really, really beautiful film directed by Robert Redford. I believe it was the first movie he ever directed, which is insane um doesn't so, he act in it too or no no, no? he does okay. not act in it no it's okay. mary tyler moore playing against type as this very cold uh sort of buttoned up woman and then donald sutherland as her husband um a very young elizabeth mcgovern also um may have been a i think it was a breakout role for her as well so hmm. yeah ordinary people would definitely recommend um and then um kind of sorry scrolling through Okay, and then the last one I'll talk about, I just watched last night, a uh, brand new release, Monkey Man, directed by, starring, written by, and produced <laughs> by, or at least story by, I don't know if he wrote the screen, he probably wrote the screenplay, um, but yeah, Monkey Can Man I just by say, Dev Patel. Mm -hmm. When people say Monkey Man, I think of Rosalie from Twilight, when they're playing baseball and she's like, my, my Monkey, Monkey Man. Man. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. It is Every truly time. the worst title. It's truly a terrible title. But the thing is, the Monkey Man character is so integral to the story. Like, I can see oh, why. Oh, that's the like, name of one of the characters in the movie. It's his kind of his. Uh, he's a boxer, like a bare knuckle boxer, and that's his persona. Mm -hmm. But he takes it because oh, of okay. a, a story from Indian uh, mythology that is really, really like formative for him. And so that theme, that idea of that character is running throughout the film. So I can see why oh, okay. they wanted to name it that. But it's it's not a great title. Okay. <laughs> but wow, this film, this film I'm, I'm a little bit mixed on just because it's like, I think it's, um, I think it has some ish, some like, you know, first time director, first time writer issues of things like pacing, um, I, I read a tweet that mentioned there's not a whole lot of establishing shots, which can help you mm. get a sense of the location, which I think is kind of correct. Um, you know, there are a lot of stylish, stylistic flourishes that, you know, maybe a little bit more kind of solid fundamentals could have helped. There are also a lot of needle drops, which may not have been necessary, but those are fairly small criticisms for me. Overall, I think this is a really, really impressive debut film. Um, it's very stylish. It is very violent and brutal and angry. <laughs> hmm. It's, um, it's all about sort of anger at inequality, at, um, the elites, at religious figures who, um, exploit and mislead and profit off the backs of the poor and the vulnerable. And it kind of is just expressing that and um 
you know, through this brutal action movie with a character who we don't, we learn a lot about his backstory. I feel like we don't learn a whole lot about him as a person. And it ends on a kind of ambiguous note where you're like, who is, where is this person going to go from here? What is the state of his soul? You know, has he found peace? Has he, is he just going to continue down the path that he is on? But it's, you know, it's thought provoking. It looks great. Dev Patel is, you know, an impressive director and of course a wonderful actor and performer. You know, he's absolutely holds the screen at every moment. So I'm, you know, again, I think this, I'm a little bit mixed on the movie overall, but I think it's really, really exciting to see his creative vision, to see him branching out into different roles in the film industry. And I think it's really impressive and I'm really excited to see what he's going to do next. Do you think it's something that needs to be seen in the theater? Because I, I, I'm intrigued and I'm interested in seeing it, but I don't know if I necessarily want to pay to see it in a theater. Like, should I do that? Or is it okay, you think, to watch it at home? It's definitely not in like an, an epic scale of like a, you know, I don't know, a, a dune or something like that, where um, the bigness of the screen is something that is essential to the viewing experience. It's very much an action film. And so I don't think it would necessarily hurt too much if you see it in the theater, if you can't, or if you see it at home. It is always nice to see films like this, I think, in the theater for the communal experience, because there is a couple, there are a couple parts in this movie where everyone in the theater kind of simultaneously cringed Hmm. or laughed out loud. Like there's one particular sequence that is so brutal, but also so funny. (laughs) We were all kind of collectively cracking up. Um, So I just, I always encourage seeing movies in the theaters when you can just because of those collective experiences um but I wouldn't say it's something that you have to see in a theater Mm -hmm. yeah well you know me I'm very anti-movie theater so (laughs) yeah (laughs) famously so (laughs) says the person who as I go through my what I've been watching list pretty much everything has been in the theater (laughs) um is there anything else you want to call out or mention uh, no, a couple other things that I'd seen that, um, you know, several rewatches, a couple of, actually, hang on, no, one one other thing that I did see, because um, I've been trying to finish up, finish up as if I don't have several dozen, <laughs> um, I've been trying to watch more Best Picture winners from the past. I saw How Green Was My Valley, mm, uh, which I've is a John Ford drama. I've never even heard drama. of that. Yeah, it's a John Ford drama from 1941, and it's about a small Welsh mining town in kind of the early 20th century, and this family, the close-knit family, and the struggles that they go through. Um, And yeah, it's a beautiful film. It's not one where I finished and I was like, I need to immediately tell everyone about this in the way that some other films from this period I do feel like... um, but it, it is a really good film. John Ford's obviously an incredible director who knows how to, knows where to put a camera. Um, all the performances are really good. Young, um, I don't know if you know who this is, but Roddy McDowell, who, mm-hmm. um, who has is. had a long, yeah, like has had like a really long and storied career. This is, I think, his debut film because he's like, I don't know, 10 years old and he plays the oh, main wow. boy in it. Mm-hmm. And he's really, really good. Um, you know, giving a really good child performance. So yeah, how how green was my valley? Good film. I definitely cried at the end. <laughs> Is there anything in your list of what you've been watching that like was really bad? Because it sounds like everything you just said was was good. I'm like, is there anything that sucked? <laughs> well, in honor I of hear about that. Uh, St. Patrick's Day, mm. I did watch Irish Wish, the uh, Lindsay Lohan <laughs> Ir- Irish set rom com, which I. I don't know if a single person in the main cast is actually Irish. I gotta be honest. <laughs> I mean, there's a character who's supposed to be Irish. I I don't know if he actually is. I, I shouldn't say that. Maybe he is. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But her, her love main love interest in the movie is an English character played mm. by an English actor. And I'm like, that seems like such a slap in the... I mean, I love Ed Spielers and he's great, but it seems like such a slap in the face to a movie called Irish. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. Well, all the people in The Irishman, the Martin Scorsese movie, I don't think any of them were Irish either. <laughs> well, did, didn't their ancestors come from, or the, the main character, didn't his ancestors come from Ireland? That's I mean, the, the actors, though. He's like the like, one Irish guy from... I don't oh, think yeah, any of the actors true. were Irish. Yeah. Oh, okay. The one other new watch that I did want to talk about that I'm more mixed on is Priscilla, mm, um, the yeah. Sofia Coppola movie, which... 
in general, I really, really like every Sofia Coppola movie I've watched. And I don't think this is a bad movie, but to me, it is her weakest film of the ones that I've seen. Um, it just didn't... It has a really good idea and a good setup, and I feel like it doesn't do anything with the character. It's basically just long scenes of Priscilla lounging around Graceland um, and then occasionally having conversations with Elvis in, in which she's very clearly toxic and controlling and she's too young and yet naive to recognize it or get herself out. And then all of her character sort of development and growth happens in the last 20 minutes or so of the film. And it just didn't really work for me as a sort of progression or a character study. You don't really learn a lot about Priscilla, even though she's, you know, the center of the entire film. She's such an opaque, the way she's directed is, is so opaque. Hmm. Um, so I think the acting is very good. Everyone does very well with what they're given. The sets and costumes are incredible. Cinematography is beautiful, but... I don't the know. Performances the performances are good too, me. right? Or or did you find mm -hmm. the performances to be underwhelming? I think the performances are good with what they're given. I just, mm -hmm. to me, the script doesn't really go dig deep in the way that I would have liked it to. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Did you see it? I did not. I'm I'm not particularly. I know you're not a big Sofia Coppola. Yeah, fan. like I like some of her movies, but I I'm never someone who is thinking, oh my gosh, Sofia Coppola has another movie coming out. Like a lot yeah. of other people do. I also am not particularly intrigued by the person of Elvis just in general. Um, there have been a lot of Elvis things coming out recently and I'm just yeah, like, what's happening? Elvis things. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean like I'm sure I'll maybe watch it eventually, but I don't really, the only movie of hers that I have ever watched and felt like I would love to watch that again is Marie Antoinette. All of the other mm, movies I I've seen yeah. are just kind of like, well, I watched it because I felt like I had to. And now I can say that I watched it. But like, yeah, I wish I'd to watched me, something else. Yeah. <laughs> to me, Priscilla really felt like Sofia Coppola kind of running on autopilot where it's mm. the, the sort of the themes and the images that she's interested in. But not yeah actually bringing anything new you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's that's what I've heard um but yeah who knows maybe maybe someday I'll I'll watch yeah. it um yeah so do you feel good about about yeah. that okay yeah cool yeah. um so like I mentioned before I have the reason we haven't recorded in two months is because I don't have time so I haven't really watched that many things um so what I have watched are things that I was like this came out in theaters and I want to make sure that I see it in theaters. So I think everything on my list, basically I saw in a theater except for one, which is the one that I will start with. Oh wait, did I talk about this already in the podcast? No, I don't think I did. Um, you can so, talk about it again. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. So I watched for the first time. Oh, I need to add this to my list of uh, 2023 rankings. Oh no, there's an intentional reason why I didn't do that. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I finally watched the movie Bottoms, which came out in 2023. I was excited to see it. I had several people tell me that they thought that I would love it. And I was like really excited. Um, I did not like this movie. Um, I'm not going to go into details as to why. Um, I don't know if my expectations were too high or I just or if I just would have not liked it regardless. Um, yeah, I just feel like it was a movie. There was a lot of potential. There was there were a lot of things that I wanted it to be. And it just wasn't that. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that. But it just was not was not uh, my favorite movie. Um, but beyond that, everything else I watched in theaters. So I saw the um, the Japanese film, uh, the an international feature nominee, Perfect Days. Um, it was it was a, it was a very pleasant movie. It's just really fun to see like a guy who has this like routine, and he's just like happily and peacefully living his life. And then little things happen. It's like, oh, man, are you going to stay in the routine or are you going to step out and try something different? Like it just is a very pleasant movie to watch. It definitely is something where you have to be in the mood to watch it. It does test your patience. It's very slow moving. It's a lot of like he does the same thing every day. And um, yeah, it's just it's a slow film. It's very meditative. It's very just like 
sit back and relax, you know? <laughs> Let um, it wash over you. Is it kind of Patterson vibes? Because you know I love it Patterson. It is. Yeah, that's a really good comparison. It is Patterson vibes. Um, but I would say there's... Yes, it is. It is Patterson vibes in terms of just like the feeling of it. But I would say what actually happens is like kind of different Um, because he ends up meeting, you know, these young people along the way and they try and like pull him out and he gets this energy. And then his niece, I think, shows up and, you know, the the relationship with his niece and you learn about her mom. And so anyway, it's um, it's it's a very good movie. I don't think I don't think I'll ever watch it again just because I feel like I got what I needed out of it. Um, but like I said, it was a pleasant watch. If you are interested in just kind of watching a movie that's very chill, but also asks some interesting questions um, and you have the patience for it, I'd say check it out. Um, then I saw two other things. <laughs> um, so I saw the movie that I have always wanted to see that I didn't realize I needed it until it came out and all of those things. I saw Love Lies Bleeding in theaters. Um, It's phenomenal. It's so good. I think, I think it's Kristen Stewart's best performance. I think um, she can be kind of hit or miss for me because I think Kristen Stewart in general, she just has isms like she has these things of, of like how she says things or how she moves her face or, you know, and she it's just kind of how she is when she acts. And sometimes she's able to kind of branch out from that a little bit more or kind of use it in a way that works more for the story and more for her character. Um, she was born to, pl- to, to play this role. Like I have been waiting for her to play a role like this for forever. And I didn't even know that I was waiting for her to play a role like this for forever. Um, so yeah, Love Lies Bleeding, uh, Love Lies Bleeding is an A24 film, um, and it follows Kristen Stewart, who is the child of a hitman, the daughter of a hitman, and she meets this woman who comes to work out at this gym where she works, and the two of them kind of fall in love, but it's not really healthy, (laughs) um, and basically things become very violent, and There's just a lot of, um, it just, it's a lot of, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, but do, 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 do. Yeah. It's just like, it's a really interesting premise because the fact that it has, first of all, this woman who's a bodybuilder, I've never really seen a body like this woman on screen before. And I think it's really just like, liberating and I think kind of innovative to have a woman like this on screen and um represent her as like someone who is attractive she's not just like this bullish woman who's walking around and just like punching people like no she's also sensitive and and kind and a human and has um, dimension to her and all of those things um so yeah I really enjoyed it uh I think it 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 surprised me in certain ways, which I wasn't really expecting, but I also didn't really know what this movie was going in. Um, I was like, is it a love story? Is it a action movie? Is it a A24 typical indie drama? Like, I don't know. And it was all of those things. Um, so, and all of the performances were great. There is some crazy hair happening in this movie. Like my goodness, Ed Harris's hair in this film is the most ridiculous like it is out there um Dave Franco is in this which I didn't even know and it's yeah anyway Love Lies Bleeding I would highly recommend it the ending is definitely um worth talking about because the ending something unexpected happens and so the movie kind of like leaves you with this feeling of okay so what does that mean was that real was that not real? What is that like? How does that reflect on the whole story of what happens overall? Um, but yeah, so that's Love Lies Bleeding. I would highly recommend it. Um, it's very good. The performances are fantastic. It's a short film. It's under two hours. Um, it's got great action, great story. Um, yeah, so that's Love Lies Bleeding. And then lastly, I saw Dune Part 2 three times in theaters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I Can saw you- 
Oh, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. Just I, I remember when you first saw it, you were a little bit lukewarm on it. But then I yeah. subsequent viewings, I saw you gave it five stars. So I was wondering if you could talk about your. Yeah, yeah. So I was going to dive into that. So I the first time I saw the movie, I went to go see it in IMAX 70 millimeter, which is like the largest possible screen you could see a movie on. I drove like four hours to Indianapolis with a friend to watch a three hour movie to then drive four hours back to Chicago. Um, so yeah, I think, um, I mean, we did an episode on this on part one. I love that movie a lot. Um, and so I think because of that, I had a, I had very high expectations going into part two, which whenever I do that with movies, I just, I need to stop doing that because it always just like things never meet my initial expectations because my expectations are not capable of being reached because they're just ridiculous. Um, but also I think more, more than that. This movie is very big. Like everything is huge. Like the the um the the ships, the cities, like everything is absolutely massive and the sound is so lo- like it's just very it's sensory overload this movie. And I think seeing it on IMAX 70 mm where everything is even bigger and the sound is even louder It just was very, very overwhelming for me. It was a lot to take in. And obviously, like, there's a lot of characters. There's a lot of details to this story. And so I was trying to pay attention to that while also, like, being overwhelmed by, like, all of these other sensory things. So I think the first time I saw it, I was like, I I didn't know whether I liked it or didn't like it. I was just kind of like, what happened, basically? I was like, so what was that experience? I don't know. So I left that and I was like, okay, I want to see this movie again and I want to see it on a regular sized screen because it was just too big. It was, it, it was too big. It was very overwhelming. Um, so when I saw it again on a regular screen, I didn't see it in IMAX, saw it on a regular screen. I was like, wow, this movie is very, very good. <laughs> um, I loved it. Yeah. I, I was very impressed with, um, you know, the cast, the performances, the nuances of the story and how we slowly progress from one thing to the next to the next. And um, the choreography is fantastic. Hans Zimmer's score. I mean, we all bow down to Hans. Am I right? Like, I can't. He's just he's a master and he knows it. Um, but I mean, the 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 Shai Hulud, the sandworms, like it's just the learning more about the religion of the Bene Gesserit and like all of these things. It really is just an incredible adaptation of a book. Um, And so after I saw it the second time, I loved it. And I was like, okay, I want to go see it again a third time so that I can have an enjoyable experience twice. Um, So when I went and saw it the third time, I liked it even more than the second time. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I look forward to watching this movie again. I don't think I'm going to go see it in theaters a fourth time. Um, there's a guy on Twitter who's apparently been watching Dune part two, like every single day or wow. something ridiculous. He's like up to like 20 times that he's wow. seen it since it came out. and everyone is like, are you okay, sir? <laughs> I mean, wow. That's a lot of time. A lot um, of commitment, yeah. That's a lot of time. But yeah, I think like the third time around, I just was so impressed by the acting performances. I mean, I, I just like. Austin Butler needs a nomination. Rebecca Ferguson needs a nomination. Mm -hmm. Like the two of them, I will be angry if they don't get nominations. But I also think that Timothy Chalamet does a very good job. I also think that, um, oh, what's the, what's the Skarsgård guy's first name? Stellan? Um, Yeah. Like he's got some really great moments in there. Cause I think a lot of the time he's this guy who's like, tighten your grip, Robin, you know, but then at the end, when he's in front of the emperor, you see these little like changes on his face because he's like nervous about the emperor. But also like, I just love that. And then I also think that I think Florence Pugh is really great. Um, she's not really in it very much, but she really commands the screen when she's there. And I believe her as this emperor's daughter who has this conflicting idea, but she's also a Bene Gesserit. Like, you know, it's just... It's an incredible film. It's very impressive. Um, Denis Villeneuve, I think I've said it before in this podcast, he's one of my favorite directors working today. Like every single one of his movies he's ever made, I've watched it and been like, that's my favorite movie of the year. Um, And I don't know if that will be the same for this year, but maybe it will be. 
it's number one so far. Um, but yeah, Dune Part Two is is phenomenal. I'm very grateful that I live in a time where I'm able to see a movie like this in theaters. Um, and I'm very interested to see what Denis does with Part Three because he's finished Book One, and I have not read past Book One, but apparently things get pretty janky. Um, <laughs> I think from what I've heard, it's the first two to three books are pretty universally regarded as good. And I think it really starts going off the rails after that. So I'm hopeful. I mean, uh, yeah. even if it book two is considered to be a bit off the rails, I'm sure Denis Villeneuve is going to be able to do something incredible with it. But um, yeah, we'll yeah. see. Part three was just confirmed, FYI. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I saw that. Um, So, Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's what we've been watching, uh, or at least I guess some of what Geneva's been watching, but pretty much all of what I've been watching. Um, so, yeah, I should probably mention because I I couldn't even remember whether I had seen it at the point that we last reviewed, but I guess not. I I also watched Dune Part Two and loved mm-hmm. it. Uh, yeah, as we discussed on our Dune episodes, Dune is not like my series in the way that it is Tatum's. Um, but I, I really, really loved. I think I liked part two more than part one. I, the pacing worked a little bit better for me. Mm-hmm. And since we had so much of the world building out of the way, we could just kind of go with the story. And I find the story really compelling. I think the performances are all incredible. Costume design, the cinematography, everything is wonderful. Um, I totally support your Jessica Ferguson, Austin Butler, Austin oh <laughs> Oscar my gosh. campaigns. They need nominations. I mean, the two of they them. They truly do. Mm-hmm. Like, Oh, so, yeah. I mean, so incredible. It was also great watching it in, you know, opening weekend in a packed movie theater in Boston, where every time Javier Bardem would go, Lisa and Al-Gaib, everyone <laughs> burst out laughing. It was great. <laughs> Wait, why do people laugh? Well, not, okay, not every single time, but there are certain times that he he says things that are really, like, they're meant to be funny. As like it's when, written. Um, <laughs> when Paul will be like, guys, I'm not the Messiah. I'm just going to work alongside you. And then it immediately cuts to Javier Bardem being like, you know, the Mahdi would be so humble. He's so he humble. He wouldn't even say that he's the it's Mahdi. It's as it's written. We must pray. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was great. A very reactive audience, which I always like. Yeah, for sure. Um yeah, great, great film. Oh, also, I think I mentioned this in our um, our Dune Part 1 review on this podcast, but again, I think it's Vanity Fair. It might be Hollywood Reporter. I don't know. But they bring on directors of movies to do, like, notes on a scene, and directors oh, yes. take one scene from a film and they break it down. So Denis Villeneuve, you know, did the Gom Jabbar scene from Part 1. And then for this movie, he did the um, the Paul writing the sandworm scene. I would highly recommend watching it because one of the things I love about Denis, which is a huge accomplishment with these movies, is he does as many things practically as possible. That entire sandworm scene was done practically. Oh, my god! Like, all of it was done practically, except for, like, the actual animation of the worm itself. So, like, I would highly recommend watching that because I was like, how in the world was this practically done? Like, that doesn't make sense to me. And it's 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 incredible. Like it's absolutely yeah. amazing. It's probably my favorite scene in the entire movie, or at least my favorite scene that doesn't involve Austin Butler. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good scene. I came out of the theater, and that was my first thought: is why aren't sandworms real so I can <laughs> ride one? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, Geneva, if you haven't watched that, you should watch it. I think you'd yeah, I think I you'd will. find I it very did not fascinating. Know that you'd done that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, okay, after spending 36 minutes talking about what we've been watching, although honestly, <laughs> to catch up that's on. pretty good. It's been a long time, so. It's been a long time. Yeah. We did a good job. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and jump into our review for today. Uh, okay, so today on the show, we are discussing the 1999 cult classic lesbian coming of age film, But I'm a Cheerleader, directed by Jamie Babbitt and starring Natasha Leone, or Natasha Leone, I always forget, uh, Clea Duvall, Kathy Moriarty, RuPaul, and <laughs> Melanie Linsky. The film tells the story of teenager Megan Bloomfield, who is sent by her parents and friends to a gay conversion therapy center. The issue is, the only issue is she's not a lesbian. She's a cheerleader. After arriving at the center, Megan meets Graham, along with a whole other cohort of teenage queer boys and girls. 
As the time goes on, Megan discovers her true self and falls for Graham, while others around them struggle to either resist or claim their homosexuality. But by the end, one thing is certain. People cannot change who they are. So Jamie Babbitt, as a lesbian herself, made her feature debut with But I'm a Cheerleader. She'd made a few short films prior. Uh, One of them was actually with Clea Duvall. And through Clea Duvall, she met Natasha Leone and uh, Melanie Linsky. Fun fact. Um, But though the film did make a profit as it grossed $2.5 million worldwide after being made on a small $1 million budget, it was not well respected at the time of its release. Many thought it to be too stereotypical of queer people and the production design too gaudy, which like, what are you talking about? mm. Um, (laughs) At the time, the film was also initially given an NC-17 rating that led to Babbitt having to make additional cuts in order for it to be rated R. Babbitt has since criticized the MPAA for discriminating against films with homosexual content. Um, And the rest of this here I took from Wikipedia, so like... That's that's my disclaimer. I'm quoting Wikipedia. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Jamie Babbitt, uh, she wanted the film to represent the lesbian experience with the femme perspective, contrasting with several films at the time that represented the butch perspective, uh, which two examples are Go Fish and The Watermelon Woman. Both great movies. Highly recommend you watch them. They're great. Um, she also wanted to satirize both religious right and the gay community, not feeling qualified to write the script herself. Babbitt brought in screenwriter and recent graduate of UCSC School of Cinematic Arts, Brian Wayne Peterson. Peterson had experience with reparative therapy while working at a prison clinic for sex offenders. He had said that he wanted to make a film that would not only entertain people, but also anger them and encourage them to talk about the issues raised. Um, And then also last thing that I found was um, she made a conscious effort to cast people of color in supporting roles to combat what she described as racism at every level of making movies. So she was clearly had a passion for just representing lots of different types of minorities and different life experiences. Um, But the question is, did she pull it off? Geneva, did she pull it off for you? What do you think of this movie? What What is your relationship to it? Tell me your thoughts. Uh, yeah, this is my first time watching this movie. I mean, I, I'd, I'd heard of it, um, that it was a cult classic of the 90s, you know, a classic of, of queer cinema. Um, it's really fun. It's really, you know, it's very stylish. I'm surprised surprised although maybe not surprised that people didn't really understand at the time that kind of tone and look that it was going for Mm -hmm. because I I think it's it was maybe in some ways a little bit no I shouldn't say ahead of its time because Drop Dead Gorgeous came out around the same time and I feel like there's some similarities with um, the kind of very sort of satirical tone of that film this one is more uh, also visually stylish you know it's very colorful it's very um, I don't know, like sort of early Tim Burtony in certain ways, but also, um, I don't know, I'm like trying to grasp for like similar, um, films with this kind of visual look, but it is very distinctive in its way. I think um, it kind of has a similar look to Barbie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could see obviously that. Barbie's very different, but like they're both <laughs> very like, let's have a set or a room where mm-hmm. everything's the same color and it feels kind of cartoonish. Like, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I enjoyed this movie. I, I'm really glad I, I saw it. I don't have a hu- huge amount of thoughts about it, but I'm more really interested in, cause this is clearly a very personal film for you. And, you know, it's just helpful kind of seeing this sort of story through the eyes of this character and kind of, the the emotional and psychological journey that she goes through in kind of discovering what her gender her um her sexual orientation is um so yeah i really enjoyed it um i think it's very well done as a film but i also really liked it just for the kind of helping me to understand better <laughs> my my friends who are gay so yeah yeah i i also was kind of similar to you like shocked but not shocked (laughs) you know that at the time people didn't really understand what this film was trying to do because in a lot of ways the movie's kind of heavy-handed in terms of like this is what I'm trying to say I'm pretty clearly saying what I want to say but the fact that people were like "Hmm, I don't know like kind of stereotypical and what's up with the production it's like guys come on you know 
Um, <clears throat> so I do think that this movie kind of came out in a time where people just weren't ready for it. Um, and also during this time period, like conversion therapy was regarded by a lot of people to work, uh, which it doesn't. And like it has caused harm for so many people. And thankfully, I mean, these places do still exist, but I think they're kind of un- almost universally recognized as being problematic and harmful um, and also ineffective. Uh, but I think, I don't know, just the timing of this. Uh, I wonder what my reaction would have been if I had been like of an age to understand this at the time that it came out. Um, but yeah, this film is something that I, you know, I'd been wanting to watch for a long time. Um, but then after I came out, it felt a lot more urgent for me to watch it. I was like, I really need to see this movie. Um, and so I saw it for the first time, I don't know, sometime last year or something like that. And I immediately fell in love with it. Um, there were a lot of things that happened in this movie that felt very, um, just representative of my experience, things that I could relate to, things that I'd never really seen on screen before. Um, or I had seen them on screen before, but I didn't connect to them, you know? Um, I think that the satire in this movie is some of the best satire that I've seen. I mean, the first time I watched this, I had no idea that RuPaul was in this movie. And the fact that one of his first lines is, I too used to be gay. <laughs> like, I didn't even recognize him. I, I, I think know. It was only later when I was looking up the cast list, I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> see and was. he's wearing a shirt that says straight is great. <laughs> it's like, <Gosh. laughs> it's crazy. Um, so, yeah, I think that this movie, I think sometimes it's, it can be most effective to deal with very difficult, heavy topics with humor. And I think that this movie just has a really good balance of that because there is a lot of pain here in this movie from lots of different perspectives in terms of, you know, certain people coming from circumstances where their parents are a lot more hateful towards who they are in certain areas where like, you know, being a gay boy versus a lesbian girl is like a different experience. And then we also have this other scene that happens in the movie where, one of the girls who's brought to that center, she basically has a breakdown and she's like, I don't know why I'm here. Like everyone thinks that I'm a lesbian. I just, because I play softball and I have short hair and I wear baggy pants, but like, I like men, like, I don't know why I'm here. And she like has this breakdown and runs out of the room and is like, I quit. And that's a whole other perspective too, of like, because she has these stereotypes, people are forcing this upon her. And she's like, but that's not me. Like, And it's upsetting to her, not because she's not affirming, but because she's like, you're telling me to be something that I'm not. Um, So, yeah, there's just there's a lot of truths here that are very hard hitting. But also there's so much humor (laughs) in this movie, like the fact that, you know, she gets to the center and they have these steps to recovery and each step gets more and more ridiculous (laughs) as it goes on. Like. Like, it's just wild. The fact that the last, I think the last step is the one that's like simulated sexual lifestyle. And it's like, okay, you're going to wear these Adam and Eve leotards and lay on a bed while I, as a creepy woman, like tell you how this works. But it's so cringe to what, like, it's just... I mean, in any context, that would be traumatic and abusive. <laughs> so terrible. Yeah. I was very curious about, because you mentioned that the screenwriter had experience with reparative therapy. I didn't do any research on this ahead of time, but I was kind of curious about those um, steps and whether they're based on real curricula for um, conversion therapy centers, you know, obviously kind of pushed into the, you know, pumped up to 11. But yeah, I was kind of curious about the, the... the steps themselves and whether those are based on what those um, centers actually teach. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, actually. I kind of want to look that up because they do seem kind of real. I mean, obviously they're satirized, but I think Mm -hmm. I feel like the idea of finding your root is something that I always heard about growing up of like, oh, that person is gay because this happened to them and Mm -hmm. therefore blah, blah, blah. Or like, these are the roles of men and women. And if you stray from this, yeah. Because I found it very interesting that the, the, um, like the 
trying to um the the conversion therapy is so based on like well once you if you conform to the stereotypes of your gender then you can't possibly be gay Mm -hmm. you know and like the gender identity is so tied into the sexual orientation part of it which of course you know makes the fact that the main character is already very stereotypically female um you know that kind of it breaks down that theory just from the very outset because the, all of the things that they're making her do are already things that she's primed to do and are good at and you know they're not working mm-hmm. yeah and just kind of the idea of you know when you're having these thoughts like we've given you this shocker to kind of they call it av i think it's like adjustment i forget the technical term that they call it in the film but it's like if you have those feelings and you create pain, then that gives you a negative association with X, Y, Z. And then if you really start trying to look at the opposite sex in this certain way, then like it will work. It's like that. That's not like, that's not how it works. Um, but yeah. So anyway, I, I kind of want to go through just the plot of this movie a little bit because it is kind of, it is kind of a simple plot in certain ways of like she gets to this center and then goes through the steps. And, you know, I do think that the ending of this movie, it couldn't have had another ending because of the type of film that it is. But also like the ending's kind of the weakest part of the film. It's cute, though. You know, she has her little cheer and whatever. Um, but it's like, OK, what happens after you get in that truck and drive away? Like, I don't I don't know. Um, but. Yeah, there's the epilogue, which makes it seems like her parents, or at least her dad, did eventually accept her. At least that was my interpretation of the epilogue. Um, yeah. But it's not very clear. Yeah, I yeah, I wasn't entirely sure either. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, obviously in the beginning, we start with her at school, and she is doing her best to make out with her boyfriend and it's the most it uncomfortable, so uncomfortable like <laughs> and i'm like to be fair like yes yeah, she is a lesbian and so that's not going to work for her but i'm like he's also a bad kisser like there's I, yeah. no straight woman that would be okay with what he's doing he's like attacking her it's like Ugh, dude it's so gross i don't know maybe there's some woman that would li- like i don't know um but yeah it's it's i mean it's a satire right like everything is so <laughs> over the top um, so that's how it starts where it's kind of establishing very clearly that like, yeah, um, she's definitely a lesbian, you know? Um, and then there's all of these, one of the things that I really connect to with this movie is like this idea that there's all of these signs that you are, but you're like, nope, I'm straight. But then everyone else is like, yeah, but you know, you've got posters of women in your locker. You don't like making out with your boyfriend. Like, you you have these lesbian icons that you follow and that you're obsessed with like all of these things and um but she doesn't she's like but I'm a cheerleader <laughs> like um I actually wrote down one of my favorite quotes from the movie where <clears throat> it's the first time she gets to the center and they're all kind of getting to know her I didn't write down the names of the different characters but basically like the other um the other girls at this center are like asking her questions and so they ask her, have you ever had a boyfriend? And she goes, yes, for two years, we've been going steady. I really love him. He's smart and popular. And then Graham goes, he and has the biggest dick I've never seen. <laughs> and then one of the other girls goes, well, have you ever had sex with him? And then she goes, I'm a Christian. And then she goes, it's really easy to be a prude when you're not attracted to him, isn't it? And then she goes, he's very handsome. And then... um, And then another girl says, but does he make you hot? I mean, do you think of him at night when you, and then she goes, I'm not perverted. I get good grades. I go to church. I'm a cheerleader. (laughs) And it's like, you can get good grades, go to church, be a cheerleader and also still be a lesbian. So I just really like how this film kind of represents that idea of there can be all of these signs that you are you, that you are who you are but because of society communicating something differently your automatic like it's called compulsory heterosexuality go look it up people it's a very important concept but society tells you from birth that you are straight and so you have to somehow at some point in your life realize and prove that you're not um and I think this film does a very good job of of kind of showing that that journey for um 
for queer people just in general, but specifically through the lens of, of her character. Um, and yeah, you know, we have this intervention scene with her family, which is kind of upsetting um, where all of them are just kind of ambushing her and they're like, yeah, we're sending you to this place. And throughout the movie, her parents keep going back and forth of like, we love you. We want you to get better. Like we want you to have a happy, healthy life. And that's why we're doing this. But also, like, if you don't change, then you're going to be cut off. You can't come home. So um, it, it looks like you had something to say. Sorry. Did you want to say something? Oh, no. I, I was just nodding. Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK. Which is like, oh, man, those parents, like, mm. it's just the worst thing that I it, oh, Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, it's like Graham's parents, they suck, obviously, Mm -hmm. but like at least they're straightforward of like, like this is wrong and we Mm -hmm. don't accept you and whatever. Whereas Megan's parents are like, oh, yeah, they keep going back and forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And it's really interesting to see all of these different people like their parents. And there's the the Jewish boy, too, who his parents have a different perspective. And um, yeah, but, you know, RuPaul shows up. And is like, I'm going to take you to this place called True Directions because it works. Because I myself used to be a gay. It's like, mm-mm. okay. <laughs> um, there's this one scene in the movie that I also uh, wrote down. Oh, it's actually that scene that I mentioned where the one girl, her, her name is Jan, actually. The one who's kind of talking about everyone says that I'm a lesbian because I look this way and I do these things. Yeah. But I'm not. Like, I'm straight. And then she runs away. And then RuPaul goes, who in the hell is she trying to fool? And then he turns around and runs after her in this like prancy sort of run. He's like, Jan, Jan. <laughs> like, it's like, dude, Oh, what are you talking about? Um, but yeah, anyway, sorry, I'm trying to figure out, I feel like yeah. I'm just kind of very boringly going through the plot. I don't really know. Feel free to jump in and say anything. I don't really know. <laughs> yeah. I haven't hosted an episode in months, so <laughs> I know, we're just trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trying to get back in the groove. Is there anything um, you want to like say or any comments or anything so far? I, for some reason, I was just thinking too about um, Miss Congeniality, which also came out around this time, and also mm-hmm. I think has some similarities to the the satirical tone that's kind of, you know, this sort of over the top depiction of masculinity and femininity from a but from a perspective that's so sort of both um making fun of it but also like lovingly in, in certain ways i don't know um i think it was mainly the um the director of the the true direction center um i forget what her name is but the lady who's like constantly wearing pink and is so uptight and then mm-hmm. she has a son who's clearly the most gay that you could possibly be <laughs> The only person that could possibly be more gay than RuPaul is that guy. (laughs) She's like trying to desperately trying to make him seem straight and it's completely failing. She's Um, like, don't sip out of a straw. How many times have I told you? Chug it. Chug it like a man. He's like, okay, mom. Clearly sipping out of a straw is gay. I don't understand. Well, she's also spraying water on fake flowers in the the front of the house. (laughs) Which is such a strange addition that just like adds this element of like, yeah, this uh this place is crazy. Like it's it's not even it's like another world almost. Just like fake. Just yeah, everything. Everything about this place is fake. Um but yeah, so I mean, you know, we have the the sequence where they start kind of reclaiming their gender roles and it's like look at this image of this woman cleaning like this is if you learn how to clean like this woman from the 1950s you will like you'll tap into your feminine straight self and then they have the men like or the boys fixing cars while RuPaul is like thrusting while he's fixing this car and all the boys (laughs) are just like you know they're trying to chop wood and (laughs) the the scene of them trying to play football (laughs) really oh my gosh (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it just, like, you know, kind of going into people criticizing this movie for stereotypes, it is kind of a stereotype in terms of, like, oh, boys can't play football and girls do this or whatever. But it's also, like, I don't know. I don't think it's playing into the stereotypes. I think it's kind of, I don't know, just kind of criticizing, not criticizing them, but just being, like, I lost my train of thought. Dang. Yeah. Well, it is kind of interesting because it's sort of, like 
Like, it's not arguing that all gay men are this way and all lesbian Mm -hmm. women are this way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it is kind of like simultaneously subverting and affirming, but in a loving, like, you can tell this is made by someone who is gay, you know, like it it's coming from within the community in maybe a way that we're more comfortable with or have just seen more examples of now. And so we can kind of understand where that's coming from. Whereas maybe at the time, I don't know where the criticism that was too stereotypical was coming from, but I could see maybe someone at the time who was like, I don't want the depictions of gay people in pop culture to be only men are only effeminate, women are only butch. I want there to be more diversity of it. And I think now at a time when there is a lot more diversity of depictions of gay people, you know, we can look at this and we're like, this is one depiction and it's very funny and it has some truths and it's not the whole scope of, you know, how gay people are depicted or or who they can be. I could see at the time, like, because there really is no representation of a gay male in this movie who is not effeminate, who is... um, No, there is. There is. Like, I was going to say, I think there actually is a bit of diversity in this because we have, like, Megan is very femme, Graham is is more butch, like... I was saying the the lesbian representation, there's a lot of diversity, just the gay male representation. with, with With the boys, there's the one guy, I forget what sport he plays, but he's like the star football player or the star wrestler at the school or something. Oh, and wait, he, which character is that? He, I forget his name, but he has like the varsity sports jacket and he gets kicked out and he's the one who goes to the house with the ex-ex gay couple. Um, oh, I don't even know. Oh, Joel. Okay. No, no, that's the Jewish guy. What's it? I'm looking at the IMDb. Yeah, I, I remember, I remember oh. that character. I just don't remember him being like a letterman. His name okay. is Dolph. Um, but yeah, like he definitely is more representative of like, like he's, he's, you know, more of a, he's not macho, but he's like more of a stronger, athletic, less mm-hmm. effeminate sort of boy, but he still is gay and, and he becomes friends with Megan because they're the ones who both get kicked out of the center and yeah. um, okay. all of that. So I, I do think there is diversity in the representation here. Um, in a way that's just very, very respectful, um, but also laughing at itself, you know, cause it's like, you have, you have to laugh. Like, it's kind of funny that there are certain people that behave certain ways within our community. Um, but also like those people are valid and they're beautiful and you know, like they are who they are, you know? Um, but yeah, I don't know. Sorry. I kind of cut you off and, and took Oh no, that's there. okay. I think I finished whatever <laughs> rambling yeah. point I was making. <laughs> yeah. I don't really um, remember where I was going with that. Yeah, I just love all the different all the different types of people and characters we have in this. Um so yeah, so we have um so Megan finally she admits that she's a homosexual, which is honestly kind of traumatic. Like the fact that they're all staring at her and she's like weeping, saying like I'm a homosexual, I'm a homosexual and everyone's kind of like just there staring at her and there's this one lady who's like good job that's the first step like there's a lot of room for growth here and it's like that's a really difficult moment to come to that realization especially in her scenario and in this time period when there were like you know she knows where her family stands with this and all of that like it's kind of a difficult realization in that moment but she's kind of like alone in that it almost feels like um but yeah, I don't know. I just find that scene to be very sad to me. Um, but anyway, I'm looking at the the plot description here because I don't want to like move too fast. But the next thing that comes to my mind is uh, when they go, when they sneak out to go to th- uh, the cocksucker, <laughs> which is the oh my gosh. <laughs> the local gay club. Um, you got to be honest. I was like, these are high schoolers. I don't know if they should be here. <laughs> They should not be drinking alcohol. <laughs> yeah, I but yeah, I I kind of agree, but also like, you know, it's a safe space for them. I would argue that going to this place and drinking alcohol is a lot less harmful than being at a conversion <laughs> therapy <laughs> I mean. center. Um so but yeah, so they go to this bar and I think I've mentioned this on on our show before when I talked about um a show that I was watching an Amazon Prime show called A League of Their Own, which is obviously based off the movie A League of Their Own or kind of an expansion from that. Um there's a scene in that show as well that we also see here. This concept of like 
someone who has newly come out going to a queer a fully queer space for the first time and just kind of being shocked by like wow there are this many people that exist that are like me and look at all of them here being like proudly themselves and not afraid and just this sense of like kind of awe and excitement but overwhelmed and just like do I belong here um and so I just really like how I like this scene how she gets there and kind of takes it all in and then she's like oh this woman's asking me to dance like I guess I'll go do that but clearly she's like I've never done this before this is kind of weird like um but yeah then we see that Graham is kind of getting handsy with the the other girl from the center who quote likes pain (laughs) um I forget what her name is but uh yeah so Megan sees that and then kind of runs out into the back alley and Graham follows her and basically because because by this point Megan is kind of developed a crush on Graham even if she hasn't really acknowledged it yet right I forget how that originates like how does that first start because they're assigned to be like platonic friends with each other right and so they kind of start spending a lot of time talking to each other and um like they're doing all their assigned chores and things together yeah Um, yeah yeah I don't remember like specifically if what the moment is but yeah and we also have that moment too where you know she's you know having thoughts about Graham and so she takes her little shocker thing to try and like stop thinking that way and then she sees two of the boys like making out on the floor and she ends up basically ratting them out she's like oh my gosh you guys are doing this like this is wrong and one of them ends up getting kicked out and um I found that scene to be very interesting as well of kind of like here she is standing in this room having these feelings about this girl but then she sees these guys and kind of I don't know projects her own confusion onto them I guess or her Mm -hmm. own shame um and one of them gets kicked out which I'm kind of like that's sad but also good for him because he doesn't have to be there anymore yeah like we learned that you know in the end he ended up in a much healthier place for him (laughs) so right it's not like you know she ruined his life but you know in the moment it's like oh that's you know that's the choice that she made this is where she is at this moment Mm -hmm. yeah totally um so yeah they they've built this this crush on each other and then when you know when they meet in the parking lot behind this this bar they you know kind of admit their feelings for each other and and they kiss for the first time and um it's just kind of this this beautiful moment of kind of of Megan solidifying that like yeah this is who I am and and this is how I feel and this is okay like it doesn't feel wrong to me but also I'm being told that it's wrong sort of thing um so yeah and then we have the the other girl I can't remember her name but the one who likes pain that's just what I keep yeah. calling her because that's what the I remember girl kind of yeah, yeah. so she uh-huh. sees them and then she gets kind of upset but it doesn't really become a huge thing um yeah does she later rat she later rats them out though doesn't she does she is that what it is isn't she the one who like when they go off and make out with each other isn't she the one who rats them out or am I misremembering Maybe she is. I I don't actually remember at all. So you're probably (laughs) right. Um, So I guess that does amount to something then. Um, But yeah, I I feel like I just remember when Megan gets out of bed to meet with Graham, you see her kind of clock Megan getting out of bed and looking kind of pissed off. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I assumed happened. But yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I love the concept of how in this movie they're just kind of representing that, um, you know, if you take a bunch of queer people and you put them into one space, it's only going to make things worse. Like, it's not going to make them less gay. It's going to make them more gay because they're surrounded by people, especially at this place. Like, they're all the same age. They're all kind of discovering things because they're of that age and, like, everything's new. And it's like if you put all of them in a space together, like... They're all going to make out. And so you see that repeatedly in this movie, whether it's the guys or the girls or whoever, like it's just this representation of like they're at this center and they're supposedly being converted, but it's having the opposite effect because that's, that's just not how this works. Um, And we just see that with so many different people in this movie, which is, which there's this one point in the movie that I really like when Graham kind of, 
makes this statement of, oh, I have to admit that I have a crush. And then she has a crush on on Joel, you know, the the, oh, the yeah. Jewish boy. <laughs> and then Megan ends up saying that, like, so anyway, we have this scene after the fact where they're outside and Graham and Joel are kind of standing there like, oh, yeah, you look really great eating that cake. Like, wow. And then Joel, I think there's this one line where he says, yes, I feel like the aggressor. And then Graham's like, yes, you're very manly. Like, <laughs> and she's just like, you know, casting looks across at Megan, who's massaging the shoulders of the 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 woman who's the head of the center, like her son, who's very clearly the most gay person here. And Megan's like massaging his shoulder. She's like, can I touch your muscles? They feel very nice. Wow. Your arms are so strong. <laughs> and while she's massaging him, RuPaul is across the way, just like staring at him, getting a massage. And he's like, Ooh, like, wow. Like that's hot. <laughs> it's just the craziest scene where, you know, Graham and Megan are making this effort to really try and connect with these boys, but also laughing at themselves because it's so ridiculous and so <laughs> dumb. Um, but yeah, I really like that scene a lot. Just like the, the dynamic of the two of them having these ridiculous mm -hmm. interactions where Joel is like, I feel like the aggressor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joel uh, is so like immediately into like, Oh, a girl has a crush on me. Okay, let me let me see if I can try and play into this, even though clearly it's not going to work out with him. But he just seemed very sincerely like, oh, like flattered, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, oh, man. Yeah, so after this, like you said, which I think is true, they get ratted out. And um, Megan basically, so Graham basically, I think Graham denies it or something like that, but then Megan doesn't. Megan takes ownership of the fact that this happened and so they kick her out but then she feels betrayed of like Graham was supposed to come with me but yeah. she didn't say anything and so now I'm here alone because um, we've learned that Graham's parents are these like rich rich waspy parents who basically say you need to go through this program and it needs to work or else we're going to cut you off and we're not going to pay for your college and you're going to be out on your own basically so there's like yeah. I mean, Megan has a lot of pressure because her family is kind of leaning toward that, too. But Graham in particular has this very, you know, intense financial pressure as well as family pressure. Yeah. And they're very, like, intensely homophobic. I mean, they're they're saying derogatory things towards these people who are teenagers, you know, like you can't. Yeah. Are they the ones that use the slur in the, the family therapy session? Mm hmm. Yeah. 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 Um. So, yeah, we, we obviously Graham is kind of dealing with a different situation, which is equally sad. Um, but so, yeah, Megan ends up leaving and going to this home with the best couple ever. I love them so much. I forget their names. I think one of them is Lloyd and uh, it's like Lloyd and I'm trying to look it up. Uh, la -da 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 -da. Lloyd and Lloyd and Larry. Um, okay. But so they are. X, X gays. So they are like former students of this center who came out and were like, yeah, we're straight now. But then now they're like, actually, no, we're not. We're a couple and we're going to have our home be this safe haven for other people that might be leaving this center. Um, and so Megan goes there. And then when she arrives, she sees that um, Dolph is there, the like the jock boy. And um I really like this couple a lot and I really like this sequence because we we have Megan and Dolph kind of bonding over this idea of we are who we are we can't change it but what does that mean for our futures like are we going to stay here we feel like we can't go home but what does that mean um and I just think that they have a really they they just have some really great bonding moments here um and yeah, I also their friendship is very sweet mm -hmm. Yeah. In a way that like that friendship couldn't have developed in the center because in the center it's all about forcing the boys and girls together romantically. And in this context, they're able to actually develop this, you know, non-romantic relationship with one another where they really click and they really support each other. Yeah, because they're able to talk to each other honestly about their struggles of like, hey, this is who I am. But, you know, like I said before, what does that mean? Whereas when they're at the center, they can't even talk about that because they, they're like, this is who I am, but it doesn't mean anything because I have to go home and I have to do this thing. And this is like the linear 
process and steps that I have to go through. Um, whereas here they can actually talk about their struggles in an honest way. And like you said, support each other in that way too. Um, I also love this sequence because I think that the healthiest relationship that we see in this movie is between Lloyd and uh, what did I say his name was? Larry. Yeah. Lloyd and Larry. Larry. Like Mm -hmm. they're kind of funny, but they're also really, really sweet. And they have this moment where they kind of have this argument. And then Larry is like, oh, no, your angry side is coming out. Do you need to talk about this? And then Larry's like, yeah, I started feeling angry. I'm sorry. And Lloyd's like, that's okay. You know, it's just this beautiful conversation of like they were both getting a little angry, but then they talked it out and then they gave each other a hug and they were like, hey, it's okay. I love you. Like, it's going to be okay. And. I really, really like that moment. Yeah. You can see it's kind of a light bulb moment for Megan in a way of like, oh, this is a relationship between equals in a way that I've not really seen modeled for me before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like the casting is great because they're kind of these weird looking dudes and one of them's really tall and one of them's really short. Um, But like they just really go together well. And the fact that they met each other through this center is kind of, you know, just like you said it's it's a it's a it's like a vision Megan is like oh I could see this for myself like I met someone at this center as well and who knows maybe we could become a couple like this um I think I just think about in my experience if I had in my teenage years actually had a representation whether in my life or in media of a healthy queer couple that would have changed my experience in so many ways. And so I just feel like there's a lot of truth to her actually seeing a healthy relationship like this and recognizing like, oh, not only is this possible, like this can be healthy and it can be good and it can be okay. Um, And so, yeah, it's just a really, a really beautiful moment and just so clever to add these little side characters that sprinkle in a little, uh, I don't know, just like some, some cute stuff because they're really cute. (laughs) Um, by the way, I should mention too, um, the, the club that they go to Julie Delpy cameo as the like mm. random woman who wants to dance with, is it Megan or is it, oh, it's like she asks Megan to dance and Megan turns mm-hmm. her down then she dances or no. And then, then she later dances with her. But I was like, oh, mm-hmm. hey, <laughs> yeah. what is this like around the same time as before sunrise? I think so. Before sunrise was a little bit before, wasn't it? Maybe not. Okay. When did Before Sunrise Maybe come out? not, because she looks younger here than she does in Before yeah. Sunrise. Before Sunrise was 95, so this is actually a little bit a couple oh, years okay. later. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Interesting. Is it before or after Sunset as well? Uh, <laughs> Mild tangent. <laughs> before tangent. Sunset is... That's nine years later, right? So... I don't know. Yeah, Before Sunset is 2004. So it's in okay. between. Gotcha. Gotcha. Like, yeah, exactly she in wasn't... She was another person the first time I saw this movie. First, it was RuPaul, and I was like, RuPaul's in this? And then Julie Delpy showed up, and I was like, she's in this? Like, what? (laughs) Um, Yeah, I also, it's so funny. There's, like, this this thing in the lesbian community where Natasha, Natasha Leone and uh, Melanie Linsky, like, neither of them are lesbian but they also have played iconic lesbian characters several Mm -hmm. times throughout their careers and all of us are like stop teasing us this isn't fair like what are you doing (laughs) whereas people every year every day who are like wait natasha leone is straight (laughs) yep yeah Yeah. and melanie linsky too like it's Mm -hmm. it's crazy clea duvall is actually a lesbian so is she okay yeah she is um which also if anyone hasn't seen the show veep like oh she involves character show? in that show yes she is um uh oh why am i forgetting uh julia louis dreyfus character's names uh selena uh, selena she is first firstly one of selena's like bodyguards or security officers or something like that but then she ends up falling in love with uh with selena's daughter and then it's just like super weird and great it's it's fantastic um because I was like I know Clea Duvall's name and her face but I was like what have I actually seen her in? and I'm looking through and she's just done so much oh yeah TV and yeah she's done so much yeah she's great um go watch Veep it's a fantastic show um I do need to watch Veep oh she was in an episode of Bones <laughs> I'm sure I saw that episode <laughs> at some point <laughs> have you watched Bones is that a show that you watch 
Oh, I was really into Bones in college. Um, really? I fell off. I fell off a few seasons before the end of the show, so I never saw the last few seasons. But yeah, iconic college mem- freshman year memory of me is wow. me and my roommate in our friend's room watching that season finale of Bones where they finally get together and just shrieking. <laughs> 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 ah, it's finally happening. It's finally happening. <laughs> I don't know anything about that show, but I know yeah. people liked it. It was one of those shows where like the the promos would come on tv and they looked really intriguing to me mm-hmm. and when i was in high school i was like i don't know if my parents would be okay with me watching this but then i got to college and i was like i'm in college now i can watch bones <laughs> so I, like, mainlined like eight seasons of bones <laughs> wow i love that like that's the show that you went to of like now i can watch what i want bones. there's a very <laughs> specific set of movies and tv shows that i watched w- freshman year when i got to college because i was like i'm an adult now i can watch these things and wow. no one can tell me I can't and so Bones is a, a big one of them. you and I need to talk about that at some point I want to yeah. know I want to know what those things are can't believe I hadn't told you that before yeah <laughs> dang we need to talk about that at some point yeah. um but anyway coming back to but I'm a cheerleader yes. uh we're almost at the end so uh mm, yeah so yeah after after Megan kind of goes to this safe haven with Lloyd and Larry and has all of her interactions with Dolph base she comes to this realization she's like you know what I'm going to go get Graham. I know that Graham, I'm kind of hurt because she was supposed to come with me, but I understand her dynamics. Like we're going to go rescue her. And so in the last sequence of this movie, we have everyone lined up for graduation and they're just walking down this aisle in ridiculous dresses. And like, it's just the costumes are absolutely, they're just like the ugliest, most over the top poofy dresses. (laughs) Like, they're so bad bright pink yeah and the so boys are bad like baby blue yeah mm-hmm. yeah and so when Graham goes up for her graduation you know everyone's parents are there and everything um Megan shows up and does this really cute cheer that she's written specifically for her that's like five six seven eight something something this is fate like it's 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 cute it's like a classic you know teenage romance movie ending um and then Graham decides she's going to run off with her. And Dolph also runs off with his guy, which I think is, is Clayton. I think it's Clayton. Uh, um, but I can't remember any of their names apart from Megan and Graham. Yeah. Um, fun fact, Clayton played Sunshine okay. in Remember the Titans. Um, but anyway, so yeah, it's kind of this open-ended, happy ending Uh and this this idea of just like Megan and Graham have their whole future ahead of them. Like they've both made these decisions and declared in front of their families that like we are lesbian and we want to be with women and we're going to be with each other. And so they get to figure out what that looks like for them going forward. And maybe they live with Lloyd and Larry for the next like five years. I don't know. Um, but Lloyd and Larry seem like people that would just be like, our home is open. You can come stay with us. Yeah, we have rainbow flags. On yeah. literally every surface of this <laughs> of this house. Yeah. Um, oh, I also forgot about that scene where um, the the I don't know if she's the owner or the facilitator or whatever the the leader of the center. Um, she has all of the students kind of go stand in front of their house with these nasty signs and just kind oh, of shout right, yeah. these disgusting like derogatory chants at them. Um, and Lloyd and Larry kind of take it in stride because they're like, this is ha- clearly this has happened to them before. Yeah. So they're mostly upset of like, how are you doing this to these children? You know, and mm-hmm. her response is just like, it's part of the process. Like, you know, yeah. um, it's just really gross. I don't like that scene. It's I mean, I yeah, I like the scene, pointed but to real life um, protest movements. But yeah, yeah, that's the thing about this movie. And that's the thing about satire. Like it hits hard because a lot of these things are things that actually happen. It's just exaggerated here, which makes it more palatable, you know, because if it was just 100% real across the board, this movie would be torturous to watch, you know? Um, So yeah, man. uh, (laughs) There's one last line that I, that I wrote down, which is in the uh, like the, the simulated sexual acts or sexual lifestyle or whatever, where, obviously like the the head of the center is like watching them do all of these weird things and kind of telling them what to do of like 
ne- next thing the women opens her the woman opens her mm-hmm. legs and it, like it's just gross and then the the jewish boy he he's like excuse me um what about foreplay which is such a kind question i'm just like what's about what about foreplay and then she goes foreplay is for sissies real men go in unload and pull out oh gosh <laughs> and then his so... son his son who's lying on the bed doing this ridiculous act just looks at her and goes mom <laughs> like, <laughs> which is like you know such a toxic misogynistic like this is within straight couples this sort of messaging has been horribly damaging and yeah yeah it's like she's got her own issues too you know like yeah yeah oh man like let's let's get into that like how has she been treated where she thinks that that's not something that's necessary or not something Mm -hmm. that she deserves or whatever and the fact that this like little boy asks i mean it's not a little boy you know he's he's a teenager. teenager yeah but the fact that he's like sexually educated enough to even know that that's a question to ask like it's just really kind yeah um and then her response is just so nasty Ugh, she's kind of a gross woman (laughs) i hated that scene oh yeah Yeah. um i don't really support her or anything that she stands for (laughs) wait Uh, you don't (laughs) no i do not uh yeah so anyway i mean is there anything is there anything um, else? Here? We haven't really talked about the character of Graham, who I, I oh, find yeah. kind of interesting because she, she's such a contrast to Megan, where Megan's Megan is very sincere and straightforward, and her journey mm. is very clearly A to B to C. Mm-hmm. Whereas Graham is kind of starting in this radically different place where she's known, it seems like, all along that she is a lesbian. And she kind of goes back and forth between sort of intentionally antagonizing her parents by kind of Mm. dressing as butch as she can and um kind of it seems like she's got the classic cigarette prop (laughs) yeah (laughs) and kind of like possibly in an intentionally self-destructive way like sort of um fooling around with girls knowing that she might get caught is sort of the implication that i got where she's sort of daring them to um catch her but then she also is tempted by, well, I could have acceptance. I could have their financial support. You know, if I just give in and stick it out for a little bit longer. Um, I mean, it, it is interesting how you wouldn't really expect her to be the one to give in to that pressure. Whereas Megan is the one who decides to run away. But that's the way it works out. And the end is Megan sort of um, being the one to push Graham into leaving rather than the other way around yeah I think that's interesting because I kind of have a different interpretation of her character I feel like I don't feel like she's egging her parents on I mean we I feel like she's trying really hard to hide who she is but it's just not working because Mm -hmm. she is who she is like I think that she is someone who is just naturally butch and that makes it harder for her but she's trying to like not be that but she can't not be that and We have Mm -hmm. that scene between her and Megan where she tells Megan, like, you can't change who you are. The secret is not getting caught. And then Mm -hmm. Megan goes, well, what happened to you? And then Graham kind of very sadly says, I got caught, you know. And I think we see in those moments during family therapy when her parents are there, like, she looks very upset. And when her parents leave, she's kind of she follows them to the front porch and is looking very um, just kind of like I don't know sadly in their direction and and she does decide to stay and go through graduation so I think that I don't know I don't think she's egging her parents on as much I think that when she's at this center that's what she's doing like she's lashing Mm -hmm. out and and because she's almost kind of in a safe space to do that because in that space she's allowed to really admit like I am a lesbian and that's part of why I'm here um so I don't know. I find it interesting that that yeah, is interesting. I don't think there's a right that. or wrong interpretation, but yeah, interesting. Yeah, I do like yeah. the character of her a lot, though. I mean, there's so much depth here. I feel like to all of these people, even though a lot of them don't have, because the movie obviously is focusing mostly on Megan and then mm-hmm. secondarily on Graham, and everyone else is kind of way more supporting. But even so, each of them get their little moments where they just say little things, and it's like, oh. I feel like I know who that character is. Like there's something there about, you know, their past or whatever. Um, yeah. I just, I, yeah, I like this movie a lot and, and 
it's one of those things where like there's just so many things here that I connect to I mean thank thank goodness and all things that be that like I was never sent to a conversion therapy center um but like there are a lot of things here that they touch on and that they talk about that are very universal to people in the queer community growing up in a world where compulsory heterosexuality is still a thing especially if you grow up religious and um you know I could spend hours kind of breaking down all of the little things here that I connect to like the concept of having a root and is that real and you know because that was something that I thought about for a long time when I was younger before I was even out like I believed that people having roots was a thing and um you know this idea of like you know you just have this misunderstanding of what the roles are because of what you've seen your parents do or because of society or maybe you could change this or whatever and it really just is a brilliant representation of which I think straight people don't understand like it genuinely is not something that you can change like it it just is what it is and it does not change and you can resist it for a long time or you can be unaware of it for a long time but like once you realize it it's like oh th- this has always been here and it will always be here um and I just think we see that so much in Megan because a lot of these other people we see them at the center when they've already done the first step of conversion which is admitting that they're a homosexual whereas Megan we see her before actively being straight and then realizing slowly, oh, I'm not. Yeah. And well, falling in love of, and all of that. There's that scene at the very beginning where she comes home from cheerleading practice and goes to bed. And then all her dreams are like close ups of the girls <laughs> and <they're> jumping <laughs> around and their, their yep. skirts are flipping up. And it's like that's where her subconscious is going, even if she's not actively pushing it in any direction or actively even realizing it when she wakes up. Mm hmm. And there's also this reality, particularly in the lesbian community. I don't know if it's as strongly or if it's as strong in the like the gay men community. But this concept of like this belief that, oh, everyone thinks about women this way. Like society Mm -hmm. has objectified and sexualized women for so long that like the way that I look at them and the way that I admire them, like that's what everyone thinks. Like this is normal. And then she gets to the center and all of them are like, no, the way that you look at women women and what you're thinking is different from how other women look at women and what they're thinking. And she's like, what do you mean? Like, this is normal. Like every, and it's like, no, sweetie, like, no, <laughs> like <laughs> everyone doesn't do this. <laughs> like, um, and that's also a very normal storyline for a lot of queer people, including myself. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, yeah, I like this movie a lot. And I'm glad that it's become this kind of cult classic because obviously, like I said before, it was not received very well at the time, which we'll see when I jump into the reviews. Like this movie is horribly reviewed on Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic. It's it's like some of the war, like it's really bad. Um, and I'm just like, that is crazy to me how society just like, I mean, it's gotten better, but still like, it's just so crazy to me that at this time the people genuinely believed these things and, and society believed these things and dang. (laughs) Especially just cause like, I, again, in the tone and the, the sort of way that it employs humor and it employs visual style. I feel like it's so, I don't even know if I could say ahead of the time because I feel like it just shaped, it had so much influence on, the queer and then eventually mainstream media that came after it you know so even if it wasn't loved at the time you can really see the way its influence has been felt Mm -hmm. for sure yeah it's it's a very good movie I like it a lot um and I feel like that's kind of all I can say about it at this point you know there's just there's so many things there that are very important and I wish that Yeah. So actually, I have a question because you had mentioned in the beginning that this movie for you, like helped you understand, I think, seemingly like more of kind of the queer experience for certain people. Like, 
do you feel like you learned things watching this movie that you didn't already know? Like, did it, I don't know. I just want to know a little bit more about like, how did this movie af- like affect you or how did you feel about it after you finished? I think just seeing the sort of emotional journey of a queer person who is initially in denial and is coming to an understanding was just kind of, it's not like I didn't anything specific I didn't know before. It was just kind of revealing and helpful, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Cause the reason I thought to ask you that is because I was just going to say, like, I think that this movie is an important film for straight people to watch, you know, like, it's it's funny and it definitely like it definitely is funny but also there's a lot of a lot of truth and a lot of depth here that I think would be helpful for straight people just to like step into a queer person's shoes a little bit but I also wasn't sure if that's actually the effect that it has and so yeah I don't know like it seems like it helped you understand things a little bit a little bit more yeah for me yeah I mean it puts you in the shoes of Megan in in the head of Megan and you're kind of learning things about her at the same time that she is um Mm -hmm. yeah I think it's very effective yeah at doing that yeah yeah I also I don't know I kind of don't want this movie to be a cult classic too because I kind of mentioned this earlier but it is something that I've thought about a lot in the last year like you know I just grew up and my only options of romantic things to watch were like the Notebook and Notting Hill and which I hate both of those movies. Oh, um, I love Notting Hill. But oh my, I'm, <laughs> I understand. I, I'm not surprised by that. <laughs> um, but like, those were the only things that I had access to. And I think about like, if I had been able to, obviously, you know, I'm not going to watch this movie when I'm ten. <laughs> it's, right, it's right, right. You know, <laughs> um, but if I had had the ability to see things like this, like Love Lies Bleeding, like Go Fish, like so many other films. Um, I just feel like my, my life journey would have been so, would have been so much more different. And so for that sake, like for the sake of younger people coming up, granted society is a lot more different now, but compulsory heterosexuality still is a thing, especially people in the church. Um, so I feel like I would love for young people to see a movie like this and then maybe it would help them in a way that like it would have helped me, but I didn't have access to it. Um, so anyway, yeah, I just think representation is very important. And I think a lot of people, particularly in religious communities have this belief that like with more representation, you're making people gay because you're showing them like, like who you should be, or this is fun or whatever. I'm like, that's not how this works like the reason that more people are coming out is because there is more representation so they're able to realize this about themselves at a younger age um which ultimately is better for them in my opinion um but yeah representation is important I'm very passionate about that um but anyway so yeah any more thoughts on this movie hmm I don't know. I think I think we touched on all the the major scenes. Um, yeah, I I don't have anything else to add. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think that I'm. I feel pretty good too. Um, yeah. Oh, do you want to dive into the critical response? Well, I wanted to say one more thing actually, and oh, then sure. yes, we can jump into the critical responses. Okay. Um, I found it to be very interesting. Again, there's all of these little moments in this movie where these minor characters, they get like one line. And within that one line, there's so much to dig into. And there's one particular moment in this movie that really strikes me every time where Megan's parents come to the center after like they've been ratted out for going to this bar or whatever. And her dad basically says to her like, because you like we would not accept if you went to this place and he can't even say cocksucker like he's a grown man seemingly in his like 50s and he's like so uncomfortable with the concept of saying that word like he not that i walk around saying cocksucker all the time like i i don't think i've really ever said that word because it's not a part of my vocabulary um, i mean i'm not thrilled with the idea of saying it either like yeah like it's yeah, not it's, yeah it's not something that i say but like the fact that he's a grown man and he looks like he's going to 
vomit, even just the concept of saying that. It's kind of like, you know, certain people being of a certain age and they can't say the word penis. It's like that's a part of human anatomy. Like it is a word you should be able to say it. Like, do you need to say penis every day in every single sentence? No, <laughs> but you should be able to say it without like, I, I, I don't know. Um, and so I just found it to be very interesting that this grown man is so uncomfortable with that word that he can't even get it out. And then her mom is able to just say it very straight up and straightforward. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was like, that's really interesting that he is so uncomfortable with this word, which is referring to his own personal anatomy, like, you know, um, so yeah, I just felt like that was another added layer there of just like, hmm, this guy has some like sexual issues too and insecurities and I don't know like just immaturities and things like that but anyway that's just like a final thing that I saw when I was looking at this um oh we didn't talk about the doghouse the doghouse is that's probably the most highly satirical part of this movie I'm like okay we're going oh, a little yeah. bit far here where we're literally putting one of our boys into a doghouse for seemingly multiple days <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, solitary um, confinement yeah, it, that's that that was a little bit way over the top for me. Um, but that is something that happens in this movie. Um, so I think that's everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you be you. Everyone be themselves. You'll like it's it's going to be OK. And if it's not, you'll find queer community and uh, you're better off for it. Anyway, so. Jumping into some critical responses, like I said, this movie does not have positive reviews on Metacritic or Rotten Tomatoes. This movie has a 39 on Metacritic, wow. which wow. I wrote down next to it. How dare you? <laughs> um, and then Rotten Tomatoes has it as a 42. I feel like this movie, I understand if people aren't like, this is the best movie of all time. That makes sense. But I feel like it is kind of objectively not a bad movie. No. Like, so 39 feels a little bit silly to me, but I think a lot of these reviews are old reviews anyway. Yeah, yeah. But I would imagine so. I would imagine if it was reappraised now, the rating would be much higher. Yeah. It just makes me sad that that is what it was initially received as. <laughs> um, I just saw the first <laughs> review that you posted. <laughs> yeah. So I was very upset with all of the reviews that I saw on Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes. So I decided to go to the internet instead where all the queer people are. <laughs> so so I took reviews uh, from Letterboxd uh, because that's what I wanted to do because I didn't want to read a bunch of depressing uh, reviews from the other more formal places. So I will read three reviews. Two of them are short. One of them is quite long, so bear with me. The first one comes from a letterbox user whose name is Will Steele, and they say, finally, a queer film with the aesthetic sensibilities of the Cat in the Hat movie. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Which, that's what we've all wanted, right? Not like, incorrect, yeah. <laughs> that's what we've all been waiting for. Um, I loved that one. And then this next one is a little bit, uh, well, it's definitely deeper because that review is like just hilarious um but this one comes from a letterbox user named kaylee and they say the thing that strikes me the most about this film at first viewing is how the harshest pieces of homophobia don't come from westboro baptist like bigots actually sent up in a funny uh i think that's probably set up i think anyway. sent up in the sense of making fun of yeah there buried. we go yeah this is letterbox people so like bear with me um, yes. So I'm gonna start over. The thing that strikes me the most about this film at first viewing is how the harshest pieces of homophobia don't come from Westboro Baptist like bigots. It comes from the people who promise with bright smiles that they're here to help and really they love you and they just want you to be normal. It's from the parents who praise Megan's progress and then tell her if she can't cure her gayness, she might as well not come back home. It's from the friends who stage an intervention for you because you like girls and staring at girls and have pictures of girls in your locker, and apparently that's a problem. It's all the well-meaning bullshit that just causes more pain, but as gay people, we're supposed to push that down and deal with it because they're learning and trying to help, and really can't you tone that down? It's just a phase. You'll, you'll only be into boys one day. 
What a goddamn difference it makes for this to be directed and made by LGBTQ plus people. There are those who intrinsically get all the parts that are heartbreaking and difficult about existing alongside others who can never understand or don't want to understand who you are. Sure, it's hilarious to hear RuPaul claim he's an ex-gay, but the humor isn't what sticks with me. What I do remember most strongly is a scared boy claiming that he is who he is who he is as he's forced out of a camp that told him they could fix him. What I do take away are two girls clasping hands unafraid, even though they should be. The movie's kitschy and bright and seems more akin to a frothy coming of age than a story about something as brutal as a gay as gay conversion camps. And this film is brutal, just as brutal and sad as it is. I'm glad that this film can look into the face of oppression and laugh at it. Resistance in the form of truly being happy, especially when people claim you shouldn't be, is more powerful than we can imagine. Mm. So I liked that one. Um, and then the last one I found is from <laughs> a user named Cat Indiana. And they say, went from what the hell to insanely great aesthetics to is this RuPaul to the most relatable thing I've seen in a long time to I can't stop crying super fast. <laughs> um so, yeah, that kind of sums up my first time watching this movie as well. Um, so let's go ahead and close out with some final thoughts. Um, I feel like I've kind of already <laughs> expressed uh, what this movie means to me, but I think um, it's just there's just such a lack of representation of queer people in media. And even within that, there's such a lack of representation of lesbians. There's a lot of I mean relatively speaking in terms of the queer community and queer representation there's a lot of gay men representation but there really is there's there's a huge lacking in lesbian cinema and lesbian content um and i think they are life experiences that need to be heard and i really like that this movie exists and it represents uh the reality of being a lesbian in a very honest way even though it's satirical um yeah, I don't know. I just find this to be a very powerful film that hits a lot of important touchstones with um, with humor, uh, but also a lot of critique and honesty. And it just asks a lot of questions of the audience of like, you know, think about what this actually means when you believe these things about people or when you treat people this way. And this movie does a really good job of showing people as humans. It's like, you're not a lesbian you're not gay you are a human being first and this other thing about you is just a part of who you are and there's nothing wrong with that so why are we making this a thing um so yeah I love this movie and I think aside from uh just the storyline itself I really like the production design and the costume design I think it's very clever to have these you know very stereotypical girls wear blue and and boys wear or girls wear girls wear pink and boys wear blue. Um, I think the performances in this movie are really strong. Um, I think that Natasha Lyonne and Clay Duvall are great. I also think that, um, Kathy Moriarty, who plays the, the owner of the, or the leader of this center, I think she does a great job. She feels so sincere, but also absolutely insane. Like, <laughs> I just think the performances in this movie are strong. I think it's very well written. Um, it's super clever and yeah, I just, I think it's great. So yeah, that's, yeah, those are my thoughts. Yeah. What about you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think this movie is really well done. I'm really glad I saw it. I think the, the tone and the style are really strong. All the performances are really strong. The satire is very cutting and, um, definitely very thought provoking. And again, like, you know, as someone who has several, people who you know friends who are close to me and who I love who are gay or bi um I really appreciated this movie for being able to represent the emotional journey of that experience in a way that is so um funny but also sincere so yeah yeah well thank you for watching it I appreciate yeah. it <laughs> um okay can you tell us what we are talking about? Well, okay. I'm just going to say this. <laughs> so Geneva and I, we are very active about building up a backlog. We like mm -hmm. to have, we like to have at least seven episodes just kind of stocked up for if we miss a week here or there, we can kind of just like not worry about recording. Um, 
we have exhausted that backlog at this point and yep. my work schedule is still quite extreme and will be for still a couple more months. Um, so I just want to say that we might be theoretically taking a little bit of a break for a while after this episode. Um, we will release episodes when we can. And when my current job ends, I would love to pick back up again and start releasing episodes more regularly. Um, but yeah, just wanted to put yeah. that out there that, you know, if you start seeing weeks go by and, and uh, <laughs> we don't have any episodes, we are still alive. That's what's going on. <laughs> the podcast is not dead. We will be coming back. Um, it's just that life is a lot. Yep. Uh, so I will not say next week. I would just say, Geneva, what is the next movie in general that we will be talking about <laughs> at some point in the future? Next movie we hope to cover, which I'd completely forgotten. I'd put this on the, the, <laughs> the roster because it's been so long, but I'm excited because this is the movie I love. Um, we're doing a Hitchcock film called Shadow of a Doubt, mm. 1943. Is I, this our first Hitchcock film on I the podcast? I think it is. Yeah. Nice. I did not realize that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I this is a I think top tier Hitchcock that's maybe a little bit less div uh, discussed than some of the others. So I really like it. I hope you, uh, yeah, I can't wait to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I I'm a fan of. I was gonna say I'm a fan of Hitchcock. I'm not a fan of Hitchcock as a person. I'm a fan <laughs> of his movies. Right. Um, he's one of those people where I'd heard legends of him as an incredible director and his mm -hmm. movies and a few years ago I was like mm, I've seen one of his movies and liked it but are, are all of his movies really that good and then I watched like six of them and I was like all of these movies are very good <laughs> he's so. the director hands down that I've seen the most movies from I've seen like between 20 and 25 wow. of his films and yeah pretty much all of them are good I mean there's maybe one or two in there that I would say are a little weaker than the others but still have a lot of you know still well worth watching so yeah yeah this is one that i have not seen i have not seen shadow of a doubt so yeah. i look forward to it um have you ever seen a random question but have you ever seen the film stoker from a few years ago with nicole kidman no okay because that film is kind of a it's not a remake you know there are different diff a lot of differences in the plot but it's sort of a like m reinterpretation of the the idea of the shadow of okay a doubt. But, is it is it of the same quality or is it not as good? It's very good. I mean, it's directed by um, Park Chan-wook. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's got Mia Wasikowska, uh, Matthew Good, and then Nicole Kidman. Okay. Um, yeah. Sweet. Worth watching. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, um, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Uh, thanks right. for being patient with us as we kind of step into a uh, weird territory where... <laughs> yeah. Things are uh, going to be kind of all over the place, but we appreciate you sticking with us. So, yeah. Yeah. We will talk to you Sometime. next time. <laughs> <laughs> next time. Yes, that's it. <laughs> all right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at yourpickpod at gmail.com. Our theme song was composed by Joel Rushton, and our podcast graphic was designed by Kara Shin. If you like this show and want to hear more, please rate and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We're excited to have you on this journey with us. Until next time.